Good evening, and welcome to another week of the Budapest Lectures. Tonight, I am very pleased to introduce you to Justin Chubo and to have an interesting conversation together about the subject of architecture. If throughout our conversation you have a question you want to ask, please ask through our app. There are little signs you'll see throughout the room that will guide you on how to do that, and we will answer them during the Q&A session of the program. So let me introduce our guest. Um, Justin Chubot is president of the National Civic Arts Society, a nonprofit organization headquartered in Washington, DC that promotes the classical tradition in public art and architecture. Most notably, he is, the, he is a former member and chairman of the United States Commission of Fine Arts. He has testified in the US Congress on topics such as the future of the National Mall and design of the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial. He is the author of Gary Towers Over Eisenhower, the National Civic Art Society Report on the Eisenhower Memorial, a critical examination of the memorial's competition, design, and agency approval. He has published architectural criticism in numerous publications, and he is a former editor at the Forward Newspaper and Commentary Magazine. Shubo received a BA from Columbia University and a JD from Yale Law School and completed four years of study in the University of Michigan's PhD program in philosophy. He is a member of the Board Advisors for the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation and the Board of Academic Advisors of the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. So welcome and welcome to Budapest. So I want to start off this conversation a little bit by asking about um, one of your more recent roles, and that was a member as chairman of the United States Commission on Fine Arts. So for those here who maybe don't know what that is, what exactly is the US Commission on Fine Arts, and what are some of the objectives you had as both a member and a chairman of that organization? Well, the US Commission of Fine Arts is a seven-member independent federal agency, uh, members appointed by the president, and we are the quote unquote aesthetic guardians of Washington DC um, overseeing the design of uh, buildings in the city. And you know, it was my um, role to try to see that Washington DC's classical character um, was protected, preserved, and furthered um, going forward into the, into the future. Um, the founding fathers consciously chose the classical style for the design of Washington, D.C. and its core buildings of government, um, creating a classical city and um, with renowned classical buildings and a national mall that fit within that falls within that tradition. And um, you know, on my time on the commission, I sought to uh, further that tradition and make sure that we um, you know, are building beautiful buildings. Um, um, not necessarily modernist ones that might be works of pure technology, but um, buildings that um, are poetic and, and have artistry. Very interesting. And did, may I ask, um, with that objective, was there any pushback from within that commission or just the environment of DC? Well, the commission itself um, ended up being um, all seven commissioners appointed by President Trump. We served four-year terms, but it just turned out that um, all seven of us were appointed, and overturning a tradition going back at least into a World War II, um, President Trump appointed commissioners who are supportive of classical design. Um, by contrast, since World War II, the commission had been almost entirely modernist in orientation. And so, you know, I was the first Trump appointee, and at the time I was very much in the minority, and you know, the modernists had their particular view of Washington, D.C., making some decisions that I might have disagreed with. But by the end of my time on the commission, the commission was really making some, you know, wonderful decisions and pushing back where pushback needed to take place um, while encouraging certain works that were beneficial. Very, very interesting. So kind of going a little bit back to basics here. Um, you know, it's clear with events like this, um, you know, coming around and clearly by the people who have attended both here and online, architecture and kind of the topic of it seems like it's becoming increasingly discussed, especially in the last 10 or 15 years. I know 15 years ago, I really never thought of architecture as something, you know, really I would ever discuss in such a capacity, yet clearly it's becoming more and more discussed. Uh, why do you think this topic seems to be growing in popularity and the discussions around it are growing? And, and why is that important that we're talking about architecture here? Well, first I would say that architecture is incredibly important since it's the embodiment of a, of a civilization. Mm 
um, you know, archaeologists, when looking at a, a particular place in time, will very much study the architecture to see, um, you know, who the people were, what they thought of themselves, who they wished to be. And architecture is also incredibly important since it's forced upon us. It's public in a way that a painting in a museum is not, or a particular novel um, is. You know, you don't have to see the painting, you don't have to read the novel, but architecture is forced upon us, and therefore it's small p political, inevitably. Um, and thus, because it's public, the preferences of ordinary people matter much more than, say, they do in a work that's of purely fine art. And then when you look to our public buildings and our government buildings, architecture becomes even more important because these are buildings that explicitly speak to um, you know, who we are as a people, historic identity, um, and so on. And so thus, it really comes to a head and really becomes political when it, when it turns to those buildings. Um, as to you know, why architecture has become uh, more spoken about, I mean, I would say that Prince Charles, actually, I mean, this is going a little bit farther back, but Prince Charles in Britain um, took some bold stands against modernist architecture in a way that was very controversial at the time. Controversial, I would say, say maybe not among British people, um, but for the architectural establishment, um, what, what Prince Charles was, was saying and doing was you know, completely anathema. But now more recently, um, you mentioned, or I, I mentioned uh, President Trump um, not, not just appointing people like me to the Fine Arts Commission, but he issued an executive order on federal architecture that completely revolutionized federal design, which had been almost entirely modernist since World War II. And this order um, gave special preference to classical and traditional design, not just classical architecture, but also to historic regional styles such as Spanish colonial or colonial revival. And from an ordinary American's perspective, I don't think the order was that controversial, but the architectural establishment went hysterical. And the order received a great deal of attention, not just in Washington, D.C., in America, but around the world. Um, because here we have a national leader paying attention to architecture in a way that has not been seen for a long time. Very, very interesting. It would, of course, be a sin uh, to have this conversation in the Scruton Cafe and not mention um, Sir Roger Scruton. Um, as a member of the Board of Advisors of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation, what impact do you think he had on this growing discussion over architecture? Well, I can tell you that Roger Scruton had a big impact on me. Um, it was when I was studying philosophy that I first um, really started thinking about the role of architecture. And I was long a fan of Roger Scruton's writings generally, but actually his first and foremost um, area of specialization was in aesthetics and architecture. He wrote one of the very best books on the aesthetics of architecture. It's a very difficult book. I don't know if I would recommend um, starting with it. But he also wrote um, a number of m more accessible, popular essays, uh, one of them collected in a book called The Classical Vernacular. And he was really one of the most brilliant, if not the most brilliant writer on architecture of his time. And you know, there's often a trickle-down effect you know, from the great philosopher like him, ultimately down to you know, people like me, and then ultimately down to you know, really the, um, you know, the, the, the real world. And so I, I would highly recommend um, you know, Roger's writing. And I would also recommend you can find on YouTube a documentary he did called Beauty, um, which is very accessible. And um, you know, he really opened my eyes to the importance of architecture, talking about the, um, the value of the classical tradition and also of vernacular architecture, because it often gets forgotten that most architecture throughout history, most buildings throughout history were not designed by architects, but are designed by ordinary builders or contractors. But prior to the 20th century, those builders would use pattern books or whether written or unwritten, certain ideas of, you know, how you can take different pieces of, a, of different, you know, vocabulary from a particular language of architecture, combine them, and the result will be pleasing. Um, and so thus, 
throughout the world, so much 20th century architecture is very pleasing. It might not be great art, but they're nice places to live. And um, Roger wanted to return to that vernacular tradition. Uh, very fascinating. So you mentioned the concept of beauty in that discussion. So I think, I think we can probably all guess what you would say, but is beauty subjective when it comes to architecture? You know, what makes a, bu a building ugly and what makes a building beautiful? Because, you know, even for me, who I, I share strongly and I've even written some on architecture, sometimes it still kind of comes down to the little adage, I can't explain it, but I know it when I see it. You know, that one Supreme Court justice said on obscenity in that case. But so, so could you add some parameters when you're talking about beauty? And is this a subjective category? Um, or is this universal, you know? Well, I'm not going to try to define yeah. beauty. I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's ever been successful at that. But certainly, I think we can agree upon certain components of beauty, proportion, harmony, size, scale, line, color, um, that there are certain elements that we see across human cultures um, that have resulted in beautiful Structures. I mean, of course, there's even also natural beauty, and you know, people might argue about you know what makes for a beautiful building, but there doesn't seem to be that dis much disagreement about natural landscapes. Everyone loves a vista. Everyone loves you know looking at a beautiful field with with a, with a river, um, and I think that proves in and of it, there, that uh, in and of itself that there's a kind of human nature that's being tapped into by beauty. Um, there's various theorists talking about how beauty, um, you know, actually uh, serves some kind of evolutionary purpose, and which is why we have some kind of innate sense that is, yes, it's subjective, but it's intersubjective. You know, all human beings being human tend to agree um, about certain things. And, you know, there are many structures around the world where there is essentially universal agreement that these buildings are beautiful, whether, you know, it could be the Taj Mahal or it could be the parliament building here in Budapest. What you really see with so much, um, you know, with the rise of modernism, it's less disagreement in, in many cases about what is beautiful, but rather whether beauty matters. So you will find architects saying that beauty is bourgeois. You know, we don't do that anymore. We don't, we don't care about that. We care about power, you know, functionalism, efficiency. They'll put other values uh, make rank other values as higher than beauty. So it's not even necessarily a debate about what is beautiful. They'll just say, well, that might be beautiful, but that's, you know, that's kitsch. We don't, we don't do that. Uh, very interesting perspective. And um, I believe if I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your organization did do some polling on traditional versus modernist structures. And it found that the, generally the, almost the vast majority of people did prefer traditional architecture over modernist architecture? Yes, I mean, um, I don't think it's a surprising finding. I mean, I think many even modernist architects will admit that, okay, that's, you know, what the people want is different from what they want. But the study found that 72% of the polled Americans um, preferred traditional over modernist design for federal buildings. And there were widespread majorities for every demographic group, race, gender, socioeconomic, even political party. Um, because certain architectural elites will try to make this a left or right issue, and for ordinary people, it is not. So, um, you know, architects, if, you know, will just very often just be dismissive of what ordinary people want. But as I was saying before, architecture is not a pure fine art. What ordinary people want really does matter. Um, very interesting um, points there. So I think it's interesting we're having this conversation in Budapest because I, I wonder if there's any other city that so, show well, so well shows um, kind of the, I would say, the decline in architecture in the last hundred years. I mean, the buildings that are in Budapest range from, you know, the Art Nouveau of the 1910s into more of the Art Deco of the mid-war period and, of course, um, the brutalism of socialism and even some modern structures. So my question is, why was there this decline? Because in some cases, it was less than 50 years you know, you went from this very ornate building of style of the early 1900s to the 1950s and 1960s where you had this incredibly modern style. I think you've alluded to it with your talk of architectures. Would you mind explaining a bit, at least your perception of why this change occurred in such a rapidly short time? Well, you know, modernism in architecture really arose after World War I in Europe. Um, you know, you could see it as 
a development of sort of uh, a lack of self-confidence among, um, you know, architects and artists seeing Europe having self-destructed and they wanted to eliminate, you know, any connection to the past and create, um, you know, a revolution in the social order. So you'll find architects both on the extreme left and on the extreme right, um, you know, trying to create a new kind of architecture to build a new kind of man in society. They thought that we had somehow broken with the past irrevocably and could therefore no more build within a particular tradition. And so therefore they wanted to start with a, a tabula rasa, a blank slate, and create, um, you know, architecture, um, you know, that, that based on all sorts of manifestos. If you, if you go back and read the manifestos underlying modernist architecture, you really can see the extremity. You know, one called for the death of a soul. Um, you know, where there's, there's even a famous saying by uh, Le Corbusier, the seminal modernist architect, that a house is a machine for living. And you just think, well, you know, if, we, if houses are machines, does that mean that humans are cogs? And in so much of modernism, you, you get the metaphor of the machine and the rejection of ornament, the rejection of decoration. Um, architecture just becomes pure geometry. <clears throat> um, and I think with this rejection of the past, you, you, know, you see uh, a separation with the tradition of beauty. Very, very interesting. So you would say that, um, in this case, especially with modern architecture, these are, in fact, expressions of an ideolo ideology that lies beneath it all? Certainly, in the early modern period, it was ideological. Um, and you know, that's why I think, in many ways, modernism was very appropriate to the communist regime, because it was another ideological um, system trying to create a new man somehow saying that we are not like people in the past. And um, I mean, I think it was in architecture, you know, going against human nature, um, which is why it's fundament fundamentally unsuccessful. I mean, human people, human beings do like ornament in their architecture, for instance. Um, you know, we don't like things that are, you know, purely functional that have no aesthetic value or just supposedly are you know, springing forth out of the nature of technology or economic system. Very, very interesting. So let's bring this conversation a little bit closer to the present. Um, so as you probably have heard about, in Hungary, um, there is often a debate about whether or not to rebuild historical buildings or to build something new on top of them. You know, as a result of both of the world wars and communism, you know, places like Budapest lost a lot of the traditional architecture that it had 100 years ago. Um, so a lot of the conversation now is, especially when we're talking about, for example, the Buddha Castle or Kushut Square um, near the parliament, about whether or not to rebuild it as it was or to um, essentially try and establish something new that, of course, would probably be in the modern style. Um, what do you think the advantages are of choosing the path of restoration rather than building you know, something new there? Well, I would say that if you had to bet, anything that's reconstructed is going to be more beautiful than anything built by you know, the leading modernist architects today. Um, and that's one reason why these reconstructions are taking place, because these are beautiful buildings. It's, I don't think there are calls for reconstructing ugly buildings. I mean, I don't know if there's debate about whether, I doubt there's debate about whether or not these uh, reconstructions are beautiful or not. They just might, say, the modernists might say, well, that's not of our time. We don't do that sort of thing anymore, or we can do better. I mean, a lot of architects are very, you know, egotistical. They think that they're smarter. They think that they're better, um, and that we just don't do that kind of thing. They don't want to be um, working within a particular tradition. Um, but, you know, there is a Success, history of successful reconstructions um, in Europe, not just, you know, for instance, um, historic Dresden, which has been a great success and is widely visited by tourists and travelers and in a way that these reconstructions end up um, paying for themselves. Like, I imagine that, you know, the, you know, the reconstructed area in Buda is going to be very successful uh, for the tourism industry in a way that a modernist building um, might might not be. Um, um, so would you say, um, you know, when we do talk about, especially in Hungary. I'm sorry, can I oh. say one, so one more thing? I forgot to mention an even earlier reconstruction that I think is significant 
is the Campanile, the bell tower in Venice. That's actually a Renaissance building that fell down in the early 20th century, but was reconstructed as it was. And I think we would all agree that Venice is all the better for having that building. It's not inauthentic, it's not Disney World, it's a real building um, built in a modern era, but in a historic style. Very, very interesting topic here. Um, so do you think, um, because while Hungary has done an amazing job at restoring historical structures, new buildings, that is buildings that aren't replacing anything, um, whether it be just thinking, you know, the, the Mol campus that's being built to the south of Budapest, or, you know, even on my street there was um, a gap that's being filled in by a, a new apartment, and both apartments on the side are extremely classical, but this new one is in incredibly modern. Um, do you think that is an appropriate balance to have, that we restore and protect old historical buildings, but if we're building new ones, they should be in the modern style? Or do you, in fact, think that maybe a, I don't know if it's radical solution, but perhaps even newer buildings, we should think about maybe building them in the styles of the past? Well, I think there's, I mean, that it's, it's very wise to work within the tradition that has shown itself to be successful, um, the tradition that was fundamentally severed with the birth of modernism in the 20, 20th century. Um, I'm not saying that architecture needs to be you know, frozen at a particular time. Um, talented architects can um, do new things. There can be uh, novelty and originality within the tradition, but what we don't need is creativity in and of its own sake. Uh, that, that makes quite a lot of sense. Um, so. MCC itself actually places a high value on architecture, and in fact, throughout its campuses in the Carpathian Basin, they made a conscious effort to buy up um, and use historically or culturally important buildings in the cities. Um, tomorrow we'll be going to Debrecen, and in fact, the MCC campus there is in a very famous hotel. It's in the center of town. It's, it's beautifully ornate. It does have a modern wing, unfortunately, I might, I might warn you. Um, but, um, and, but even here, um, you know, we plan on tearing down um, the main MCC building, which is um, a, a communist era building, and replacing it with something newer and more organic. Um, but do you think um, his, historical preservation should also apply to some of these communist buildings? Do you view the history of them, even if they're ugly, um, warrants their protection? Or do you think that essentially we should strive to tear down even historical ugly buildings? Well, I would say that the world is not a museum of architecture. Um, you know, buildings are living, breathing things that people actually have to see and use on a daily basis. And so therefore, you know, preservation of a building is something very different than, you know, should we preserve a sculpture in a museum? Um, and that really the, the, the needs and desires of actual people today should be paramount. And if people see an ugly building and wish to tear it down and replace it with something better, I think you know, there, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, issues of sustainability and, and um, you know, to, the, to, the, to, the so to the side. I mean, architecture does have two components. You know, there is inevitably associations that we have with buildings and styles, and so if you see um, a communist era building and you think of communism and every, everything it represented, you're gonna think about that building in a particular way, but buildings do also have independent aesthetic value, um, you, you know, and that aesthetic value lasts regardless of, of how associations might change. I mean, I think of the Colosseum in ancient Rome, you know, for the ancient Romans that meant one thing, for the Christians it meant another, and now it means something different for us today, um, but all throughout it's had aesthetic value, and I think when you know, the question about whether or not we destroy a communist era building, um, I think that becomes a harder question if those buildings had aesthetic value. But I think in so many cases, and the vast majority of cases, they do not. And that the reason, the only reason that they would be, be preserved is to try to make the world a museum of architecture, which I think it fundamentally is not. Now, if the building's off in the middle of the forest and, you know, people might make a pilgrimage to go see it, well, that, that's fine. But in the middle of a city, um, we really need to focus on what is the, the best and most humane building that we can construct. A very interesting perspective. And, and unfortunately, the communists rarely built their buildings in forests. They always love to make sure their uh, architecture dominated the landscape. I particularly think of um, the Marriott Hotel in Budapest, who if 
oh, only I had enough dynamite, you know, I would wish to be removed from, uh, from the viewpoint. Um, so many critics of classical style architecture, which you point out, never seem to critique the beauty because they themselves know what is being built is beautiful. Um, they see, I often hear sometimes claims of, it's too excessive, it's too ornate, or sometimes it's too expensive. We just don't have the, the money to build that. Uh, are, are these actually accurate claims these people are making about expenses? Um, what is your thoughts on this? Well, first I would say that it's an open secret about how many modernist architects live in classical and traditional buildings. Um, there is an interview of the Dutch modernist architect Rem Koolhaas and the, the reporter from a German publication was asking him, where do you live, where do you live? And he's like, it's irrelevant, it's irrelevant. And it turns out he lives in this you know, beautiful traditional Victorian building in London. And you know, sort of modernism for thee, but not for me, because you know, who wants to live in a brutalist house, right? Very few people want to. And so thus, like, that's more evidence that you know, they actually do know what's more beautiful and more pleasing. But in terms of you know, ornament and cost, well, first I would say that you know, we have new kinds of technology that bring down the, the cost of doing ornament. Um, you know, even in the case of stone, there is CNC machining that can use um, like essentially robots to do sculptures and to do a first draft. Maybe they'll be finished by hand, but can really bring down the cost. Um, but I would also say that you know, aesthetics matter that you know, we don't want to live in a world as if it was only designed by engineers. You know, just get functional boxes with no aesthetic value. And that human beings do have a need for ornament and decoration. I mean, you can say, well, why should women wear jewelry? That's just a waste of money. You know, well, and it, and it is in a certain way, but I think my, my, my wife would disagree with that. Um, no, the point is, is that we know what is beautiful and it's worth the cost. I think it's a really valid point. So I would ask now that we've established, you know, what exactly it is we're trying to preserve. How then can we, just as average people who if we want to preserve or expand beauty in our average, work, average daily existence, what are some of the things that we can do, whether collectively or individually, um, to help make this happen? Well, you know, I would say that we can, um, you know, try to speak to our political and governmental leaders to try to influence them to you know, steer public architecture in um, a good direction. There can also be you know, the public involved on planning boards. Um, you know, there's an interesting case of what's going on in Britain with the um, Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission um, where they are now requiring that there be public input um, on developments, residential developments, um, throughout the country. And the idea being that, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, that people have a right to say in what is being built where they live. It can't just be dictated from above by architects, um, especially in a, in a time like now where architects are, have such different perspectives than ordinary people do on building. Um, but I would also recommend that um, people educate themselves on architecture. I think so many people have good intuitions about what makes for a good or a bad building. Like even if you can't articulate it, you might know I like this and I don't like that. Um, but you need to become educated to understand why you, know, you might feel that way. What are the parts of a building? What is the term for the various ornaments or orders of architecture to become more confident in expressing your opinions? Because you know, if you're in the lucky position to be a patron of architecture, architects can be very intimidating. And you know, there are a lot of, say, politicians who are you know, afraid to stand up to an architect and say, no, I don't like that. Um, in the past, there were politicians, you know, I'm talking about early 20th century before, who might have more education, they might be more cultured in architecture and therefore know what they want. Um, you know, a, an interesting example of this um, was President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In the 1930s, the Jefferson Memorial was proposed for Washington, D.C., as you may know, it's inspired by the Pantheon. It's in the style of a Roman temple, an ancient Roman temple. And the architecture establishment was adamantly opposed to this building because it was the quote unquote modern era. This is the 1930s. Um, the head of the Harvard Graduate School of Design called it an egg on a pantry shelf in the middle of a geometric Sahara. 
But FDR, um, who had traditional tastes in architecture and was also actually an amateur architect in his own right, pushed back and he said, Jefferson was a classical architect. I mean, Thomas Jefferson himself was a classical architect. Washington is a classical city, and it's a beautiful design. And he got the monument built over the objections of the architecture establishment. And I think it would be great to see more leaders like him. Really interesting perspective. So to bring this out a little bit, um, for most of this conversation, we've kind of been talking in the um, Western context, you know, Western civilization. But do you think these rules should also apply to countries outside of the West, such as maybe China, Japan? Um, should they, do you think they should aim at preserving their own classicism? Or would you think that they should adopt Western classicism as, as their concept of beauty as well? Well, I, I don't want to you know, tell these other people exactly what, what they should do, but I think speaking very broadly, there is um, you know, a different kind of classical architecture for different great civilizations. I mean, you can go see Islamic arch classical architecture or Chinese classical architecture. It's only in the 20th century that we see this break with the past and then the, the birth of all these ugly buildings. And so it, would, you know, it should be up to each um, country to determine you know, their own path forward, but I would say that there is always wisdom in the great tradition, and you know, there is something to be said for building within a national style. Like personally, I'm happy when I go to a particular place and it has a particular character. I don't want to go to a generic city that looks like any other generic city around the world. I mean, I don't think that's what tourists want either. People come to Budapest because they want to see a particular kind of architecture. Um, or they go to Rome to see a particular kind of architecture, and there's some, you know, beauty in these in these local traditions um, as opposed to a generic architecture. But you will actually find certain modernist architects saying we should be building generically. Um, one of the people I mentioned before, Rem Kulhas, actually has talked about this. It's not as if um, you know they disagree disagree about what is generic. They just think, well, that's the nature of modernity. You know, modernity is globalized man, Davos man, and building should reflect that. Very, very interesting. Would you say, let's say, um, you know, we made an effort to return to classicism. Would the architects we have now, being the broad majority of them, be even capable of designing classical buildings anymore? Or have they fallen so far away? You know, do, do they teach classicism still in architecture school or in training? Well, What's the state of the institutions? Sadly, very few architecture schools teach traditional architecture. I mean, one of the main counterexamples is the University of Notre Dame in America. But yes, I mean, if architects have been diseducated, then it's not fair to them to ask them to design in a more traditional way. Um, it's, it's a major challenge, but there are some bright spots. There's Notre Dame, as I mentioned, there's also Catholic University. Um, there's something called the Institute for Classical Architecture and Art that gives, gives courses. Um, but the tradition you know, has really been tamped down and it's gonna take some time for it to come back. But there have been other dark periods in architecture, there have been revivals in the past. There was even a so-called renaissance in the past, which was, of course, looking back to um, an earlier, earlier kind of architecture. Well, on that positive note, I will conclude my line of questions and turn over to the audience for some questions. But thank you so much for uh, answering my own. So I have this one question that uh, jumped out on me, and it's about functionalism. Mm -hmm. So can classical architecture satisfy demands for functionalism in the 21st century? as much as modern architecture does now? I mean, I would say that classical architecture is infinitely adaptable. And in fact, you'll find ancient buildings from Rome that are still in use today. Um, a good building um, can serve many different functions um, over different time periods. And in fact, what you'll find from so many modernist buildings is that their function, they might have been built for a particular function, but then the building cannot be adapted for any, any other use. Um, and there are, you know, examples of new um, traditional buildings going up that are built for modern needs. Um, but then there are examples of traditional buildings like Grand Central Terminal in New York City was built at the turn of the 20th century, but the train station is still completely functional um, today. Um, or there are certain skyscrapers built in New York in the early 20th century that are still completely functional skyscrapers. And in some cases, they found that they are as energy efficient, if not more energy efficient, 
than modern glass and steel, be glass and steel buildings. Thank you for answering that. Um, I have another question here, which is, what is the role of classicisms in megacities that have recently been born out of almost nothing? Such as he, um, this qu uh, questioner gives Qatar, Dubai, Singapore. Um, what is the status of these cities uh, with regards to classicism? Is there any present in these that were built almost out of the desert? Well, when you think of a place like Dubai, you see these you know, hyper-modern buildings that you know, show no connection to anything historical. I mean, you could imagine a different um, architecture that is still contemporary and also um, looks back to um, you know, Islamic architecture. And there are you know, contemporary architects in the Middle East who build you know, beautiful buildings within that tradition. Um, you know, if a, but if it's a place like Dubai that's sort of built out of nothing, out of the desert, well then, you know, maybe that, you know, hypermodernism is is good for them. Um, but I don't know if it's it, these are humane buildings that I would prefer to, you know, to be around. Thank you. Um, I have another question here, which I think actually addresses an important topic, and that's kind of. Uh, what is the view of classicism versus modernism on the role and structure of public squares? Well, I think it's, you know, I've been, I've been talking about architecture, um, but I think there's been a, a, modernism has almost never been successful at creating good public, um, pu public spaces. There might be some good modernist buildings here or there. I'm not a fundamentalist. You know, I can appreciate the Sydney Opera House um, as a, as, as a uh, successful modernist building. But when it comes to like an ensemble of buildings to create a place that you want to be, you know, beautiful square or piazza, there are very few or almost no modernist examples that I can think of. And, and, and I would say one reason for that is, um, you know, modernism really dispensed with the idea of the facade that buildings have faces. Um, you know, we, we actually as human beings tend to see faces um, in our buildings, you know, windows being eyes, doors as being a mouth. And when you see at a building with a facade, you know, which comes etym etymologically from the word for face, you can see a building that looks back at you in a certain way. But if it's a glass wall, it's like looking at someone wearing reflective, you know, aviator sunglasses. They're not looking back at you. There's no, there's no facade there. And, um, you know, that's one reason why it's hard to have a beautiful um, street wall if it's just modernist, if there's no articulation or there's no, no detail. Very, very interesting. Kind of going off this topic, what do you also think the role classicism plays in, we, right, rather I would say, would you say classicism is more built for people rather than modern architecture and specific reference to, for example, cars? Because I know a lot of people talk about how modern cities aren't built for people, they're built for cars. You know, do you think that's also a reflection of a modern, you know, modernism and progressivism in architecture is that they're actually built more for cars than they are for people when it comes to walking in cities? Well, you're talking about urban, urban planning, yes, and obviously so much of, you know, 20th century and now 21st century urban planning has been based around the car as opposed to public transportation or something even older than that, which is just walking. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I think roads are, you know, wide roads are inherently ugly, uh, while narrow streets and smaller streets are, you know, just create better places, better places to be. Um, but, you know, when you say is, you know, modern architecture for cars over people, I would say that also so much modern architecture is for architects, mm -hmm. right? They are building for each other. They're building to be in the glossy magazines. They want to be, imp they want to impress their colleagues. They want to win the right prizes. They don't really care about what the ordinary Joe thinks about them. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually have one question which might be interesting to hear the answer to is, who is your favorite modern architect, if there is one? Um, well, maybe, you know, I mentioned uh, the Sydney Opera House, so that's designed by Saren, and, and I think maybe one reason that some of his buildings are successful is because he's using organic, um, what seem to be organic or biological forms, you know, so you look at the Sydney Opera Hall and you can sort of see maybe, you know, like mollusk shells or something like that, or you see the TWA terminal in New York, which obviously is inspired by birds. And, you know, one thing I didn't mention when it comes to like the nature of beauty is that human beings um, experience biophilia. We love living things, you know. We love trees, grass, nature, animals. 
and so much traditional architecture actually um, incorporates natural motifs. And, you know, you can just think of a Corinthian column which has the actual leaves in it, or the column itself is really based, about, uh, based on the you know, proportions of a, of a human being um, sta up, you know, standing upright with the capital being the head, the shaft being the body, and the base being the feet. Um, and so modernist architecture that is more representative or using um, natural forms, I think, is more successful. Um, speaking of natural forms, you know, I mentioned in your introduction, um, you've written on the Eisenhower monument uh, or statue. Um, so maybe let's have a little bit of a discussion about statues rather than architecture. Would you say the rules that we've talked about, how, how do the rules we talk about when it comes to classicism and building apply to things such as monuments and statues? Well, I would say there is a, first say that there's a famous line from the architecture critic Lewis Mumford who, um, a modernist, who said that there is no such thing as a modernist monument, that it's a contradiction in terms, basically saying, well, we don't build things like that anymore that valorize um, things from the past. And I would say, um, you know, modernism has really struggled, struggled with monuments as, as, a, as a type. Um, I mean, this, now, you know, we're heading into, you know, art itself because, you know, Monuments are very often works of art more than they are of architecture, though sometimes they combine the two, like the Lincoln Memorial. Um, but you know, so much modern art is abstract, and so therefore it struggles with doing anything that is symbolic or representational. And so you'll get sort of a, a monument that's more of an ink blot, where it's what you make of it, as opposed to a, a mo monument that is telling you what you should think about something. Um, that has a particular perspective. Very interesting to, to see that go. And what we're actually, just maybe to explain, would you mind explaining a little bit about the Eisenhower Monument and about why, that, why you wrote a book on it? You know, why, why that was necessary? Sure, so the Eisenhower Memorial, which is in Washington, D.C., um, right near the National Mall, when the design was proposed, it engendered great controversy. It was designed by Frank Gehry, the Canadian-American architect who's been called the world's leading star architect. And it's a gargantuan, grandiose design that's so big that you could fit the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial inside of it. The main feature is a so-called steel um, tapestry. Really, it's more of like a screen that's 80 feet high. Well, I know this is a metric country, but put it this way, it's so big that it's bigger than the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. And that depicts an abstract um, drawing of the Normandy beach today at peacetime. That's what it's supposed to be, but if you looked at it, it just looks like a bunch of squiggly lines. It's an example of this abstraction that I was talking about. And ultimately, um, you know, the memorial seems to be more of a memorial to Frank Gehry than it is to President Eisenhower. And, um, you know, the, originally the sole statue of Eisenhower was going to be a life-sized seven-year-old barefoot boy seated on a plank. And it was really cutting a great man down to size. Um, and you have to understand, not only is it going to be a little boy like this big, but surrounded by uh, this, you know, enormous steel screen. So really the proportions and the symbolism was completely topsy-turvy. Uh, just amazing that, you know, something like that could actually be seriously proposed in, a, in the capital of the United States. Um, so I think we have time for around one more question. Um, so I think I'll end on by asking you, do you think, how does classicism stand um, in the terms of climate change? So as, do you find classicism tend to be more of a green architecture than modernism is? Do you think it can stand up to the challenges we face from climate change? Well, I would first say that the most sustainable one is one that doesn't get torn down. And building waste is a huge amount of waste. I think maybe even in America, um, the, the greatest contributor to waste in the country is building waste. Whenever you tear down a building, there's a ton of rubble and all that it has to go somewhere. And the buildings that don't get torn down are ones that are adaptable over time, which I would say traditional buildings very often are, and also buildings that are beloved. Um, you know, we try to avoid tearing down beautiful, beloved buildings, but if something's ugly, then it's more likely to get the wrecking ball. Now, that has pros and cons, a con being that, you know, it is a kind of waste of building materials. 
Um, I would also point out that a lot of traditional ways of building use less embodied energy. So there's not just the energy in the use of a building, um, you know, how much the electricity, how much electricity a building uses, but how much energy goes into constructing the building. And um, it does not take as much energy to cut stone as it does, for instance, to make giant glass windows. Um, and in America, when buildings are judged on, you know, green grounds, usually embodied energy is completely ignored. The assumption is it's going to be a modernist glass and steel building. Now let's look and see which are the better buildings, as opposed to looking at a masonry building, which actually can have you know, great insulation values. Really compelling argument you make. Well, I want to thank you for coming here and speaking to us. Uh, I hope everybody else has learned just as much as I have in this conversation. So we really want to thank you and the audience for coming here and listening to this very important topic. So thank you very much. And uh, this will conclude this week of the Budapest Lectures. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you.